Well, folks, the world is full of ugliness, but people just never tire of staring at it. It's the train wreck effect. You just have to look. So why not take a glance at some of the ugliest weapons in history? Now, by ugly, I don't mean ineffective or not badass looking. You know, some of the most imposing and coolest looking things aren't necessarily pretty. And obviously, this is just my personal opinion. I'm not here to trash anyone else's personal sense of aesthetics or cultural heritage or whatever other sentiment. And if you are that easily and irrationally offended, feel free to share your sweet tears of butthurt in the comments down below. I'm sure it'll be entertaining. And in order to not make the video 20 hours long, I had to limit a little bit. So I'm going to be focusing just on European weapons before World War I and no firearms. I feel you can make an entire separate video just about ugly firearms in history. And I'm also excluding one-of-a-kind pieces, like the bizarre sword of Maximilian II with a sawfish blade. That is quite hideous, but very one of a kind. All right, let's get started. There are a few swords that I find downright ugly. There are plenty that I find mildly unappealing or uninteresting, boring, just not my cup of tea for whatever reason. But this one does cross the line just about. That's number 10, the Spadroon. Uh, this only just about made the list, hence number 10. It's, you know, not absolutely appalling. <laughs> but it's it's not pretty. So this is an 18th century design, essentially the battlefield version of a, a small sword, which was the upper class dueling weapon of the time. Uh, this one people love to hate on because it is impractical for a variety of reasons. It's not very good at cutting due to the light narrow blade, it's not very good at thrusting due to the flexible blade and all of that, but as far as I'm concerned here it's just about the looks. And I'm generally not a fan of many swords of the era. You know, be it back swords, sabers. And the thing with this is that it takes the small sword, and it is clearly a, a small sword hilt, and then it ruins what elegance the small sword has by putting a beefier blade on it. And it doesn't really work for me. Now, as far as a small sword is concerned, I'm not a fan of either. It's a bit too specialized for me, but I can at least appreciate it. There are some pretty fancy, elegant looking ones, so that's okay, but the Spadroon just takes that and kind of messes it up. Here's an example of a later version of the Spadroon. This one here is early 19th century, and this one doesn't have the small sword hilt going on anymore but it's a very bland type of blade. You know, just simple straight, very little taper, a very simple kind of round-ish point. And the hilt is also just not really my thing. It's, it's just too minimalist, too simplistic. It does have a knuckle guard, okay, but the way it's shaped, it's just, you know, not really my thing. This is highly subjective. The next one might be slightly less subjective. You be the judge of that. That's number nine. Uh, certain copper and bronze daggers. Uh, I say certain ones because it's very specific forms that I'm talking about here. So the Bronze Age started around 5,200 years ago in the Aegean and roughly a thousand years later in Central Europe. And uh, here we've got an example of a Calcolithic uh, copper dagger, Calcolithic, that's quite a word, uh, or Copper Age is the transitional period between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. And uh, so early bronze daggers, as you may suspect, they just weren't very sophisticated to say the least. Some have this really wide, fat leaf blade shape like this one here. And a lot of them are very, very crude looking, uh, both, both the blade and the handle. And yeah, they're just not really great pieces of art. There are some bronze daggers that are debatable, like this one here. Some people may like that. I personally cannot stand the combination of, of that uh, disc pommel and then with the, the very strongly flared round 
a guard, if you want to call it a guard. And then they have the triangular ones, which are even worse in my opinion. That's a clear nope. <laughs> Not my thing at all. Here's another good or rather bad example. The one in the center. Such a spatula of a dagger blade. It's... it's really unappealing. Okay, and here's proof that not all Bronze Age daggers were ugly. Far from it. This is a replica of the Mycenaean Lion Hunt dagger, which is around 3100 to 3500 years old. And that one is gorgeous. No doubt about it. All right, let's move on to number eight, the Sword Breaker, which is a particular type of paring dagger. Paring daggers appeared in the late 15th century, and then in the 17th century they were often referred to as main gauche, which is French for left hand, or sometimes also called left hand dagger, which is not really a good term because a left-handed person would use it in the right hand. It would be better to call it offhand dagger, but parrying dagger is, is a better term in my opinion. Now, the sword breaker is a misnomer. You just... I don't buy for a second that you could actually break a rapier blade with one of those. It's, you know, just with a, a movement of the wrist, you don't have enough strength there, and rapier blades are quite sturdy, so there's no right way that that would happen. So, better term here would be sword catcher. So these have teeth, and sometimes with hooks, designed to trap an opponent's rapier blade. So the thing is, I like parrying daggers, always have, and the teeth are very useful, but they just ruin the look. I just cannot stand how that looks. This one here is also slightly curved, but still also mostly straight. It's such a abomination, in my opinion, as far as looks are concerned. So, yeah, pairing dagger is good, but this, nope. Number seven, a particular form of the bill, which is a type of polearm. Now, I don't mean this type of bill hook. Uh, that one wouldn't win a beauty contest either, but it's not, not bad. I can appreciate it. But rather, this is an example of what I mean. Uh, 16th century English bill. This one is just kind of crude looking, and I don't mean the corrosion, that's that's a given, but just the shape. It's just this kind of rectangle that a spike has been just popped onto, and then it was split and drawn out into the spikes, and yeah, it's, it's not great. Uh, this one here has a more pronounced hook, but still, it looks too random, kind of. And this one, again, is, in fact, this is even worse, in my opinion. It just looks like they, they just randomly split it and, and shaped it haphazardly. And uh, let me tell you, they don't get any prettier with age. They really don't. Next up, number six, the Vulge. This is often referred to as an early halberd. Um, just like the bill, this polearm comes in different varieties. I'm referring to some 14th and 15th century examples here. And, yeah, same issue as with the bill. It's a rectangle with a spike. It's just... it doesn't really have much going for it. It's a very, very simple shape. One of the simplest shaped weapons you can find. And particularly if you look at an overview, this here, the Vulge, all the way on the left. If you compare that to most of the other pole arms, it just loses out aesthetically. The others look far better. Late halberds can be very elaborate, very pretty. Even the simpler ones can look far better than this. Number five, the Bollock Dagger. Also called Kidney Dagger by prudish historians of Victorian times. No, that's, that's not what it's supposed to be. So these were used from the early 14th to about the 17th century. I mean, maybe if you are a big fan of the male anatomy, you might find them more visually appealing. I don't. To be fair, there are some more stylized ones that can be very well made and look fairly good. Like these here, you know, that's, that's okay. But then there are also more um, anatomical ones, which I'm not a fan of. And if this makes you angry because it just so happens to be your favorite type of dagger, you know where you can stick it. Number four, the cheap dusak. Emphasis on cheap. There are fancy dusaks with elaborate complex hilts, but this is the budget version. As cheap and simple as it gets. One piece construction, 
this can be hammered out <laughs> pretty quickly. And um, yeah, these were found in parts of what is now Germany, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Yeah, not much to say here. It's just kind of crude looking. And that's the idea. It's supposed to be cheap. Cheap and usable. That's it. Uh, this is probably the worst example. Yeah, this is the worst example that I've been able to find. It's not pretty. For number three, I'm breaking my rule here, but I wanted to include it anyway. That's a strange chopper depicted in the Machiovsky Bible. I think that's more or less how you pronounce it. And it's sometimes also called a Godunak. Uh, technically, I'm cheating here because, you know, this is only found in depictions. As far as I know, there are no physical finds of it. And um, so the question is, was it really common or used at all? Or was it just artistic license? Who knows? There's a single-handed and a two-handed version. And uh, this essentially looks like a medieval orc sword. That's, that's pretty much it. If, if orcs existed in the real-life Middle Ages, they would have used this. Straight up. So, <laughs> I actually find it pretty interesting. I would love to get one, a reproduction of one of those to test it out, but I cannot argue with the fact that it is ugly. There are some reproductions of these available at Calavathena, by the way. I'll leave a link down below in case you're interested. Okay, then, number two, the Gisaum. Now this, like with many other pole arms, there are plenty of variations and some confusion about the terminology, which, to be fair, is largely artificial, because people in historic times weren't that specific, really. So we have to come up with terms to distinguish one type from the other, which they really didn't at the time. So these were used from the 11th to the 15th century. Now, personally, I wouldn't mind a battle scythe, which is the basis for this. You can clearly see the scythe influence in that. But then they put this hook spike thing on, and even two of them, and that just makes it look goofy. Just ridiculous, in my opinion. It just completely ruins the look. All right, so number one. What could be uglier than all of these? What about a spiked mace or club? If you have to bludgeon somebody, but you just had an argument with your mother-in-law, this is what you come up with. It's not enough to bludgeon them, you have to pierce them at the same time. One of the simplest, crudest, and most brutal weapons. You can find them in one form or another all over the world, you know, across most time periods. Quintessential ugly weapon. You just pick up a tree branch, shape it roughly, put some nails through it, you're done. And even the most well-made versions are essentially still just a spiky stick. I mean, that's really what it is. You take a piece of wood and you put some spikes on it. it doesn't get much more basic. And uh, generally I find the more spikes and the longer the spikes, the more revolting it is. Um, here's an example. This is technically not European. This is from India, but it illustrates the point. All right, that's it. But before you go wash out your eyes with bleach, I'll leave my Patreon page and a few other links down below in case you want to support the channel and help fund future videos. That's about it. So thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.